I knew I was innocent, but I knew that he didn't care. Accused. The sheriff was going to do everything in his power to make sure I went to prison. And convicted. Everything went numb. An innocent man heads to prison. I lived with serial killers and rapists, child molesters. For a crime he didn't commit. I literally had men gambling as to how long it was going to take me to be killed or raped. Welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. Terry is in the Ukraine helping little orphans over there. And with us is a good friend, Wendy Griffith. Glad to see you. She's left the CBN <laughs> newsroom for a day and is here with us for the next couple of weeks. It's good to see you. Well, thank you, sir. It is so wonderful to be here. We're delighted. <laughs> it's going to be you got a it's going special to be fun. piece you're going to show us in a few minutes, too. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Well, anyhow, we'll get to know Wendy a little bit better later in the program. But first in the news, people in Colorado are picking up the pieces after the worst wildfire in that state's history. And investigators suspect that someone actually started the fire intentionally. And while Colorado was dealing with a massive fire, other parts of the country were facing heavy rains and flash floods. Gary Lane has a story on these major disasters. Firefighters working around the clock to contain Colorado's Black Forest wildfire receive some added help Sunday, as heavy rain helped slow the spread of the destructive blaze. Nearly 500 homes have been destroyed by the wildfire. Two people have been killed. Evacuees attempted to enter the fire zone this weekend to see if their homes had survived the devastating fire. Police prevented many of them from entering. All of us are getting treated like criminals. We can't come out. If we come out, we can't go back in. We have a crime scene in there. We have fire in there. We have down power lines in there. We have trees falling each time there's a gust of wind. Those that managed to get through were shocked at what they saw. This man says his daughter lost her home. The people that lost their homes, they're going to hit bottom again when they see theirs for the first time, which probably will be this week. While fire crews continue to dig up hot spots, fire investigators are sifting through the ash, trying to determine if the fire began accidentally or if someone deliberately ignited the blaze. While heavy rains were viewed as a blessing by many in the Colorado Springs wildfire zone, elsewhere in the country they were viewed as a curse. More than 17 inches of rain near San Antonio, where Texas Rangers endured waist-high floodwaters, searching for people in need of rescue. The monsoon-like rains caused the banks of the Rio Grande to overflow. Heavy rains also pushed into America's heartland. Nine to ten inches of rain fell in the span of a two-hour period Saturday in Springfield, Missouri. Flash floods washing cars right off the roadway. Even though your vehicle's heavy, that water is buoyant and can actually lift you up a little bit in your vehicle. And that's how you lose traction and get blown off the side of the road and can get into real trouble that way. The severe spring weather isn't over yet. Much of the nation is expected to experience extreme weather throughout the week. Gary Lane, CBN News. Well, our prayers are with those in Colorado. It's hard to understand what it'd be like to just see your life savings, your home you love, just wiped out, just completely gone. And uh, it's a tragedy. And, of course, tragedies are taking place. And this weather is unbelievable, unbelievable. Well, I don't know any of the prophetic significance, but it certainly is that... Uh, Mother Nature has turned up the spigots on us all around. 500-year uh, uh, records being broken in Europe. Well, it turns out that uh, not only is the U.S. government uh, conducting extensive spying operations, so are our allies, the Brits. Lee Webb is going to tell us just who they've spied on. Here's Lee. Pat, a British electronic surveillance agency reportedly hacked into the phones and emails of foreign politicians and other officials. The London Guardian newspaper reports the agency did the snooping during two major international summits in London four years ago. And it raises new questions now about the surveillance programs in the UK as well as here in the US. The allegations became public only hours before Britain was due to open this year's G8 international summit. Some visiting delegates may want to know now if the U.K. spied on them in 2009. Syria expected to be the top issue at the G8 meeting. President Obama has talked about arming the rebels in Syria. But the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee says Congress wants to know just what the administration plans to do before it approves any aid. 
We've asked them to come up and say, if we're going to move this direction, you're going to have to come up with a more comprehensive plan. I mean, it seems to me they have a great media strategy. They don't have a great Syrian strategy. President Obama plans to meet with Russian President Putin about Syria. Putin says other countries should not be arming the Syrian rebels. Many analysts are calling Iran's new president a moderate, but they caution don't expect any real changes in that country. Chris Mitchell has the story from Jerusalem. Iran's new president Hassan Rouhani won in a landslide. The 64-year-old successor to Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is promising a revolution in Iran's economy, culture and politics. Regarding the Iranian elections, we in Israel have no illusions. But Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu stressed Rouhani has limited powers. While the elections no doubt expressed a dissatisfaction of the Iranian people with their regime, I don't see it uh, producing the genuine change in Iran's nuclear policy. The ultimate power in Iran, including its nuclear program, rests with Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. Before the election, Israeli Minister of Strategic Affairs Yuval Steinitz told foreign journalists Iran's nuclear program is not about producing a nuclear bomb or two, but rather a nuclear arsenal. We are not speaking about the Iranian bomb. We are not speaking about having few bombs in the shelter like North Korea. Once they will be there, they will produce dozens, and later on it will take them time, maybe even hundreds of nuclear bombs. He warned if Iran gets a nuclear arsenal, it would be the first time in history a fanatic religious government possessed nuclear weapons. If the Iranian will gain nuclear weapons, this is going to change the course of global history. Rouhani once served as Iran's chief nuclear negotiator. He hinted about his approach to Iran's nuclear program when he said in 2004, while we were talking with the Europeans in Tehran, we were installing equipment in parts of the nuclear conversion facility in Isfahan. By creating a calm environment, we were able to complete the work there. This method of gentle Iranian diplomacy on the surface, while it races toward a nuclear arsenal behind the scenes, is what alarms many Israelis. Clifford May of the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies told CBN News, Iran remains the number one enemy of the U.S. and Israel. Iran represents the most important strategic threat to the United States. That means Iran seeks to diminish the United States, to destroy its influence in the Middle East and as much of its influence everywhere as it can. But it's not a strategic threat, but an existential threat to Israel. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Former Florida Governor Jeb Bush says he has not decided to run for president just yet. But if he does, he tells CBN News he will run on his record. Bush and other potential contenders spoke at the Faith and Freedom Coalition's Road to Majority meeting this weekend in Washington. He tells CBN's David Brody he solved problems in Florida from a conservative perspective. It had the look of a presidential campaign rally and provided a conservative audience for some politicians to test the waters and their message. There's a war on Christianity, not just from the liberal elites here at home, but worldwide. If we are silent about the issues of our time, then who will speak? But a lot of eyes and ears are waiting for Jeb Bush, a potential frontrunner with a familiar last name and a pragmatic reputation who wants to focus on solutions, not party squabbles. We could uh, focus on all of our disparate parts, all the d points of disagreement that uh, conservatives have and never win again. After the 2012 defeat, the Republican National Committee concluded the party needed to come across as more inclusive. Certainly, social conservatives are a huge part of a winning coalition, which means that we have to change our language to be inclusive, but not be not abandon principle. But those are fighting words to some of the conservative base who believe the word inclusive translates into squishy or moderate, definitely not principled. Yet in our interview, Bush says he is principled on traditional marriage, despite seeing the culture become more sympathetic to gay Americans. I think we can be respectful, we can be compassionate, we can talk about this in non-judgmental terms, but ultimately for our country's success, 
traditional families are what are going to end up uh, uh, leading our renewal. Bush grew up Episcopalian, but converted to Catholicism when he married his wife. He says his faith really convicts him in one specific area. It informs me about the questions of the dignity of life more than anything else. I think life is precious from beginning to end. There's no doubt a Bush presidential campaign would tout a list of conservative credentials. But some questions linger, such as, will his support for comprehensive immigration reform hurt him? We should deal with the millions of people that are here illegally to give them a path to legal status. And will the family name contribute to a reputation as a mainstream Republican establishment figure? That could hurt him in the GOP primaries if he runs. What do you say to those critics? If I decide to run for office again, it will be based on what I believe, and it will be based on my record. And that record was one of solving problems from completely from a conservative perspective. I cut taxes every year. I shrunk the size of government. I acted on my core beliefs on social issues as governor. You know, I, don't, I will, I will uh, be able to, um, I think, manage my way through all the chirpers out there. And those chirpers will no doubt get louder if Bush decides to run, something he will really start thinking about next year. Thank you all very much. David Brody, CBN News, Washington. And at that same event, the Faith and Freedom Coalition honored CBN founder Pat Robertson with a lifetime of achievement. He was given the coalition's first Winston Churchill Award. The group's leader, Ralph Reed, said that like Winston Churchill, Pat Robertson saw opportunities where others saw only difficulty. And where others saw only their ambitions, Pat saw God's kingdom. Pat said he was honored to be given an award named for Winston Churchill. He said the former British Prime Minister's contribution to freedom is monumental and an inspiration to us all. I want to say tonight that you and I are not going to give up the fight until this great nation is once again lifted to the place it deserves among the family of nations where it will be a bright, shining city on a hill, where it will be the hope of the downtrodden throughout the earth, and where indeed we can say proudly we are one nation under God. Pat, well said, and congratulations. Well, thank you, Lee. It was a great honor, and I appreciate uh, being there. It was a, a wonderful uh, tribute. Um, my family uh, is descendant from the Churchill family. John Churchill, the first Duke of Marlborough, was one of our collateral ancestors back in history. And uh, we've had a John Churchill. My uncle was named John Churchill, and so we've had my mother was Gladys Churchill. We've had mm. Churchills up and down what the line. What a great honor, and to, to receive the award named after someone you admire so greatly. I, I, I indeed did. What I did in my little uh, speech uh, remarks, I compared and contrasted uh, Churchill as prime minister with Barack Obama as president. Oh my. <laughs> what each one did in the same crisis that mm. came before oh, them. Oh, I would I, love to hear that. <laughs> I, th I think it's uh, very telling. <laughs> anyway, it was a wonderful event. I, I enjoyed it. I was uh, deeply uh, gratified by the love that was shown. It was, a, it was a wonderful time for me. All right, well, coming up, a new motion picture from the makers of Soul Surfer will go behind the scenes of Hoovy. So don't go away. Hi, I'm Chuck Woolery. You know, over the years you've heard me say two and two, but now I'm here to talk about three for free. If you're struggling with pain and infection from old style catheters, then you need Medical Direct Club's new virtually pain-free disposable catheters. Right now you can get Medical Direct Club's three for free sample pack with one self-lubricating catheter, one polished eyelet catheter, and a travel size catheter. You get your free pack, see which one's right for you. You use an old style catheter, they're rough, they're very painful. The new ones, virtually pain free. You know, Medicare and your insurance now pay for up to 200 of these virtually pain free catheters per month at little or no cost to you. And if our catheters aren't virtually pain free, then we'll pick them up for free. You'll never know unless you try them. Call now to get your three for free sample pack. Call toll free 1 800 206 3360. That's 1 800 206 3360. Call now. Tuesday, 
she buried her son. It seems unnatural for a parent to have to bury their child. But she couldn't bury the past. Hatred began to set in just right then. Her struggle. I never ever thought I would be put back together. And what happened when she met the killer? I wanted him locked up, caged, because he was an animal. And that's what he deserved. Tuesday on The 700 Club. Well, welcome back. Um, fans of The 700 Club know that Wendy Griffith is no stranger to this program. For nearly 15 years, she's been a familiar face on this program. And while you may know her as a reporter and an anchor, we here at CBN know her as much more than that. Watch this. The spiritual and Wendy began her career at CBN in 1999 as the congressional correspondent on Capitol Hill, where she covered one of the biggest stories of the last century, the impeachment trial of President Bill Clinton. Wendy Griffith, CBN News, Washington. A year later, she moved to CBN's Virginia Beach headquarters, where she became the co-anchor of CBN news programs, Christian World News, and later CBN's nightly news show, News Watch. Over the years, you've also seen her fill in as news anchor on The 700 Club, host telethons, and bring you stories from around the world. Part of the Decapolis mentioned in the Gospels. In 2001, she covered the kidnapping of American missionaries Martin and Gracia Burnham in the Philippines, who were held captive by the Muslim terrorist group Abu Sayyaf. And last year, she returned to the Philippine jungles for another look at these terrorists. And you might remember her series of stories from New Zealand, especially the one where she was dropped 200 feet on what's known as the shot over canyon swing. Wendy loves to interview celebrities and had the chance to turn the tables on the one and only Bill O'Reilly. That's something I got to work on. That's why I go to church. I got to work on a humility thing and recently sat down with one of Hollywood's hottest new actors, the new Superman, Henry Cavill, from Man of Steel. Well, what fun! This is your life. I know! Yeah. It's like 15 years boiled down into yeah. one minute, well, 13 seconds. Great career, <laughs> including the PR director for a governor of West Virginia. Didn't say that. That's right. I was uh, press secretary to the late, great Governor Underwood. Yeah. And uh, that was quite an experience. I guess. He was quite a man. He, he was our youngest governor mm -hmm. at the age of 34 and also became our oldest governor at the age of 74 with exactly 40 years in between. You didn't have to spin the news like that poor soul that's up there at the White House right now, did you? No, we were. He, he, I, you yeah, know, he was, West Virginia, is, he was yeah. a Republican, a yeah. Republican governor in a very Democratic well, state. So no, we. Is, what you see is what you get. That's Just right. keep our guns and... <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Get your hands off the coal industry. All right. Well, Wendy has filed reports from all around the world, and recently she went deep into the heart of Texas to the set of a movie that's in production now called Hoovy. <laughs> and it tells the true and inspiring story of how a family learned on their faith, or lean on their faith in each other. Wendy Griffith has more. We're here on the set of Hoovy in Waxahachie, Texas. An all-star cast behind me is putting together the real-life story of Hoovy, a young man who overcame incredible odds because of his faith and courage. Director Sean McNamara of Soul Surfer fame once again brings a story of triumph to the big screen. When 16-year-old Eric Hoovy Elliott collapses on the basketball court, Doctors discover a life-threatening brain tumor that could derail all of his hopes and dreams. After high-risk surgery, he must relearn life's fundamentals, walking, reading, even seeing clearly. Actor Cody Lindley plays the title role. I've always wanted to be in an underdog story, and I feel like this is an ultimate underdog sports movie, you know, doing these type of things where I'm walking with the cane, it made me really humble and really want to ask questions and understand his struggle and his, his, his way of overcoming it. Hoovy's real life parents, Jeff and Ruth Elliott, say they could relate well to the biblical story of Job. During the time Hoovy was sick, their daughter also got very sick. Ruth lost her job and overwhelming medical bills threatened to undo everything the couple had worked a lifetime to build. Like in Job, even well-meaning Christian friends accused them of not being right with God. Very good friends that said, oh, you must have terrible sin in your life that uh, you're, you're being punished for. 
um, just like in the book of Job. And that's why we related so much to that book, because these were Christian friends who go to church with us, and they said, obviously, you've got some, you know... Unresolved, unresolved sin. sin. With his family's love and tenacity, as well as his relentless determination to get back on the court, Hoovy surprises everyone, even his parents. Yeah, there it is. I believed he would make it back. I didn't think he'd make it back to the level that he did. And we would look out the window and just wonder, oh my goodness, what have we inspired him to do? Um, but you know, against all odds, and even when the therapy was over, he continued it on his own at home. It's a miracle. Jeff wrote a book about his son's amazing comeback. After being rejected by more than 100 publishers, he self-published, but didn't sell many copies. Five years later, Jeff and Ruth got a call out of the blue that someone wanted to make a movie about their story. You know, it's pretty amazing how it's all come together. So many times uh, that we just literally gave up and we said, you know, God, if this is to happen, you're going to have to take over. And every single time he did. When I gave up, he took over. We arrived on the set the day they were filming a dramatic car accident scene. Actor Patrick Warburton of Seinfeld and Family Guy fame plays Hoovy's father, firefighter Jeff Elliott. He says it was inspiring to have the real Jeff, who is one of the extras, on the set. Yeah, it's fun. You know, and at the end it takes like and goes, ah, you would have done it. Right, I did it differently. <laughs> he also says his mother is very happy he's in a faith-based movie for a change. She was thrilled, you know, just beside herself. <laughs> Actress Lauren Holly, a well-known face from movies and television and real-life mother of three boys, plays Hoovy's mother, Ruth. When I read the script, I cried more than once, and I just really wanted to be a part of it. And then, now that I've gotten to know Ruth, we're going to be friends forever. <laughs> the real life Hoovy learned to read again, dribble, and not only play basketball again, but went on to receive a scholarship to play college ball, where he scored 30 points and a winning shot in a regional game. I realized that I was so close to, to not having this life. And, um, every day is a gift from God, and you really need to cherish it. Um, just love on your wife, love on your kids. You know, that's what I try to do. Well, what a great story. And I, I love when yeah. it's based on true life, yeah, because you sure. can't do better than true life. And what Ruth said that I'll never forget, she said, you know, when everything is going, if everything can go wrong, Mm -hmm. then everything can go right. Yeah. And of course, Job saw that, you know, and he got everything back in the end. And so that's what happened to them. They have a real fairy tale story now. Well, don't you hate these well-meaning Christians that say, well, this must be sin in your life. I mean, you know, I, I, I served on a um, task force on victims of crime. Uh, and uh, we were, you know, interviewing various police departments and so forth. And the terrible thing was that some of these Christian counselors would go to a victim and say to that victim who'd just been raped or beaten or, you know, robbed or whatever, so there must be some sin in your life. I mean, it was just as if to say, I've, I've already had this tragedy and God's against me. I mean, it was just horrible. These people don't know what they're talking about and they shouldn't be allowed just to. Just the opposite of what Jesus would have said. Exactly. You know. But Job's friends, you know, they, well, there must be something wrong. You wouldn't be having this trouble. Well, that, that wasn't what happened. Well, now they got a book deal and a movie you know, deal yes, and they're becoming famous. Be. So, uh. Uh, is, he, is he going, is he still playing college ball? Is he still? No, that, that was years ago. No, it was he, it years ago? But he did play college ball and scored like the winning point in this this real tight game. Okay. And, and, I mean, all of his basketball dreams came, came true. Well, it's a beautiful yeah. story. We look forward to seeing it. Okay. Let's all right. Back. Let's uh, up next. An innocent man who was sentenced to 60 years in prison. I lived with serial killers and rapists, child molesters, thieves, liars, cheats. I literally had men gambling as to how long it was going to take me to be killed or raped. Find out what set this man free when we come back. The news never stops. As a news reporter, I get to travel across the nation producing stories that affect people everywhere. A lot of people work behind the scenes to put it all together every day. Whatever the topic, I have the opportunity to tell others what I see. My faith in Jesus Christ motivates everything I do. I love meeting people from all walks of life, and I get to report on stories that you won't see anywhere else. 
My name is Mark Martin. I'm a news reporter and I work at CBN. Today we're on a field trip to discover what inflation is doing to our paper money. In this hand is a $20 bill and in this hand is a $20 US gold coin. They used to have the same buying power, but how much can they buy today? In this first basket is what my $20 bill buys. Milk, bread, peanut butter, and jelly. And here's what one $20 gold coin will buy. Six baskets full, worth nearly $2,000. Almost a hundred times more food, simply by owning gold dollars instead of paper dollars. History shows that the gold coins have been the best way to beat the rising cost of living. So class, the moral is that unless you want to live on peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in the future, you should turn some paper dollars into gold coins now. How and why is explained in a new book, The Great Debasement. Call the number below for a totally free copy. And that's the simple truth. If you have Medicare and have a chronic breathing condition, you can take your medication using an inhaler. Or this, a portable nebulizer from Med for Home. Independent studies have shown a nebulizer may be more effective and easier to use than just an inhaler. Impressive. It's like getting hospital quality treatment at home. So call Med for Home today to find out more. Med for Home is a specialty pharmacy that's here to help you however they can. They'll deal with your doctor, the paperwork, even ship for free. And their pharmacist and respiratory therapist are available 24-7. What's more, your nebulizer and medications may even be covered by your Part B benefits. For a better treatment at a much better price, call Med for Home now to learn how a portable nebulizer can help you start breathing better today. For more information, call 1-800-210-5821. CBN TV on CBN.com. All the video you love in one easy to use location. Well, if you have any empathy in your heart, think what you would feel like if suddenly you were taken out of your home, taken away from your family, taken away from your job, locked up in a cell, and then put in a court where you were convicted of a crime that you did not commit and were condemned to life in prison. Well, that's the story we're about to tell you right now, and I think it will touch your heart, the story of Josh Kieser. It has a happy ending. November 1992. 19-year-old Michelle Lawless was found in her car in Benton, Missouri, brutally beaten and shot to death. Josh Kieser, an 18-year-old gang member with a troubled past, was arrested. The sheriff and prosecutor quickly built a case against him and brought him to trial. The only problem? Josh Kieser was innocent. I mean, I knew that the sheriff was gonna do everything in his power to make sure I went to prison. I knew I was innocent, but I knew that he didn't care. The evidence spoke in my favor. Um, there was DNA found underneath the victim's fingernails. The FBI actually tested the DNA and excluded me. There was no fingerprint, no palm print, no weapon, no paper trail, no motive, no connection to the victim. It took only three and a half hours of deliberation for the jury to arrive at their verdict. Guilty. Josh was sentenced to 60 years in prison for a murder he did not commit. It's still hard to think about. Everything went numb. In the distance, I heard yelling and screaming. And I realized that at that moment, what I was hearing was myself yelling, I didn't do this. I didn't do this. Before the trial ever began, Josh received a Bible in jail and had started reading it. He says he renewed his childhood faith. Just kept reading, kept reading through the scriptures, kept reading through the scriptures. And what was happening is I was finding myself like knowing I've always believed this stuff. I was leaning on Jesus immediately because I didn't have an option. He became my best friend. He became the person I talked to about everything because I had nobody else to talk to at times. That faith became his only source of hope. 
as he entered the Missouri State Penitentiary, once labeled the bloodiest 47 acres in America. I lived with serial killers and rapists, child molesters, thieves, liars, cheats. I lived around a nightmare. I lived where every corner you walked around, there could be bloodshed. Josh says it was God who kept him alive and gave him hope. I literally had men gambling as to how long it was gonna take me to be killed or raped. And the hand of God was on me throughout the entire experience. It was an awful experience, but I became something different. I became a Christian. When you have Christ in that place, you can see the sunshine. You notice the life around you. That's the beauty of getting to know the Lord, is living in that nightmare, but living in purpose, where there is no purpose. Living in um, peace, where there is no peace. Feeling free, where everything around you is confined. Inmates and chaplains alike witnessed Josh's faith and the persecution that came with it. It was a constant barrage for Josh to, to, be, uh, to stand so strong with his faith that, that God was going to deliver him from these things. He focuses in on the Word and he focuses in on his God and he still had that hope when it seems like, you know, no one else believed in him. But after two failed appeals and little hope for release, there were moments when Josh struggled to keep going. On two occasions, he prayed that God would end his life. I did not want to wake up another day in prison. I was tired. And I had had enough. And he would tell me quietly, I've gotten you this far. What makes you think I can't get you to where I want you? And he started whispering in my heart and in my mind, five years from now, none of this is going to mean anything. Around that time, Jane Williams from Love, Inc., a prison ministry, heard Josh's story and helped get his case reopened. I wanted to be declared actually innocent judicial terminology and God gave me a piece about that God was about to show off he was about to do something that hadn't ever been done before and I knew that I believed that after 16 years in prison for a murder he didn't commit Josh had a new trial this time by clear and convincing evidence he was declared innocent an outcome only Josh had seen coming I had seen God just deliver me from situation after situation after situation. People that tried to attack me, beat me, rape me, kill me, and things I had seen God deliver me time after time after time after time after time after time. How could I expect anything different when that time came? I'm very thankful for what the judge did, and I'm very thankful for my attorneys and the people in my life. But above all, I'm thankful because God gave them to me. And it was He that set me free in my spirit, in my heart, in my mind, and in my body. Today, Josh is a free man. He surrounds himself with people who love and support him in his faith. He encourages others to put their hope in Jesus during their times of trouble. Just turn to Jesus. In your moment of desperation, turn to Jesus. I want people to know that the Lord is the Lord of hope and that he's not intimidated by anybody's problems. He's not shocked by your struggles and sins. He can handle you. And he can handle anything you're going through. And he still does miracles. And on occasion, he reaches into a prison and he sets a man free after 16 years. What a message of hope and encouragement to all of us. John Schieser, ladies and gentlemen, what a tremendous testimony of the power of God. You see, God is on the throne. We look at the story of Job. He lost everything. He lost his health. He lost his money. He lost his, his children. He lost everything. And then people taunted him trying to say, well, you've sinned as you've done some terrible thing, and they gave him all this nonsense he had to listen to. But in the end, God vindicated him. And he said, I know that my Redeemer lives, and in the end, I shall stand before him. I know that my Redeemer liveth. 
And Josh knew that he had a Redeemer who would deliver him. But what a story of faith. Let me ask you, are you going through a trial? Have you been unjustly accused of something, something you didn't do? People have mocked you. Your reputation has been in tatters. And you've been just crying out, oh, God. Well, I'll tell you what. You hang in there, and you believe in God, and you give Him praise, and you praise Him. And as you praise Him, there will be a way out of the wilderness. As you are, have overcoming praise, God will see you, and He will set you free. Now, if you want to be free, if you want to have something happen in your life, I want you to pray with me right now. Pray with me. These words, Jesus, you know the charges that have been brought against me. You know unjustifiably that I have been accused. You know the enemy that has placed burdens upon me that seem unable to be borne. And I think of the words of Elijah the prophet that said, Take away my life, Lord. I'm not worthy to be alive. Take away my life. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, right now, I come to you and I ask you to deliver me from this bondage and restore me to the place of the children of God. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Now, if you need further prayer, the telephones are available. It's on your screen right there, 1-800-759-0700. Toll-free number. If you prayed with me and you accepted the Lord, I want to give you this, and you can ask for this little packet called A New Day. But I ask you to call now if we can help you, 1-800-759-0700. And more than anything, declare the victory that you feel in the name of Jesus. You are set free. Wendy, what's next? Amen. Well, coming up, we'll hit the field with Dodger slugger Adrian Gonzalez. But first, Pat will step up to the plate for another round of Bring It On. Patricia says, my friend told me that I have to attend every church service in order to be a committed Christian. If I don't, she says she'll no longer be my friend. Does God require this? Your email questions are next, so stay tuned. I had chased the record deal for years with no results. And then I let it go and I turn it over to him and then there it is. I want people to know that you can't be bad enough for God to not love you or forgive you or to give you a second chance. He doesn't give you the right to judge you, so stop there and learn to love you the way he loves you. And then you can enjoy life more than you've ever enjoyed it before. Open your ears, people. Your phone company's living in the Stone Age. Barbaric pricing models. Outdated technology. What we need is a company that connects us with generosity. Is that so crazy, businessman? Not to me. In fact, we should talk. Meet Vonage's new chief generosity officer. We shall no longer let time nor distance keep us from connecting. That's crazy. Crazy? Crazy generous. Let's see what we did. <laughs> we turned it around. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgendered Americans are on average less religious and less happy than other U.S. adults. Those are the findings from an online survey by the Pew Research Center. 48% said they had no religious affiliation compared with only 20% of the general public. And only 18% call themselves very happy compared to 30% of all U.S. adults. CBN's Superbook aired throughout the Philippines this month. An estimated 1.2 million people watched the episode In the Beginning. It aired on a major television network in the Philippines that broadcasts throughout that country. And Nielsen rated it as one of the top programs of the day. Thousands of viewers responded by texting and posting comments to the Superbook Facebook website. There were more than 1,800 professions of faith. 
And you can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by logging on to CBN.com slash international. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club after this. Children, each of them precious, each of them a gift, each of them unique. All of them are a work in progress, a story being written, a sculpture taking form. That's where Superbook comes in by providing a strong spiritual foundation for the children you love. This month, Joseph and Pharaoh's dream. My own brothers sold me as a slave. They would explain to my father that I had been killed by a wild animal. A story of betrayal and forgiveness. All I want is a chance to find out what kind of men they are today. Join the Superbook DVD Club and get Superbook's newest episode, Joseph and Pharaoh's Dream, plus two copies to share with others, all for your gift of only $25. Pharaoh himself is haunted with the most terrible and confusing dreams. Can we find anyone else like this man? Any chance you know those guys at the door? Those are my brothers. Get Superbook and watch the miracles happen. In 2008, my husband, Gary, departed for heaven. I was still grieving. And then to find out I had cancer, I began praying, God, how do I do this? Where do I do this? Cancer Treatment Centers of America was the place. Dr. Neelam outlined a plan that would take care of my mind and my body, and she prayed with me. For Bible-believing Christians, we're able to pray with them in a much deeper way as they begin to really rely upon their faith. At Cancer Treatment Centers of America, we believe in the power of faith and prayer as indispensable allies in the fight against complex and advanced stage cancer. I'm back in Telluride on the mountain skiing. I feel strong and healthy. Advanced medicine and technology. And I am a survivor. The warm embrace of the spirit and the power of prayer. These are happy tears. Please go to cancercenter.com forward slash faith. Appointments available now. Cancer Treatment Centers of America. Care that never quits. Tuesday, she buried her son. It seems unnatural for a parent to have to bury their child. But she couldn't bury the past. Hatred began to set in just right then. Her struggle. I never ever thought I would be put back together. And what happened when she met the killer? I wanted him locked up, caged, because he was an animal. And that's what he deserved. Tuesday on The 700 Club. Welcome back. In Honduras, one out of every four children suffers from chronic malnutrition. Children like Wilson, who often go to bed hungry until Operation Blessing arrived in his village. I looked for a tortilla in the basket, but there weren't any. I went to bed hungry. 12-year-old Wilson had eaten the last tortilla the night before. It had been his only meal of the day. Now, with the corn flour gone, there was no food for anyone. I pray God to help my father to have money to buy food. A blight had wiped out the family's potato crop. Losing that crop meant losing six months' income. I saw my father very sad and my mother crying and praying all the time. Wilson sometimes went to find work with his dad but working together, they only earned a few dollars a day, barely enough to buy food. The family's pastor knew about their situation and called Operation Blessing. Soon, we brought large sacks of seedling potatoes and fertilizer for everyone. Wilson grabbed his old work boots and tools and went to help his dad with the planting. The small community pooled their resources as they waited for the new crop to grow. Finally, the potatoes were ready to harvest. I have never seen such a big potatoes like those. They were huge. Wilson's dad sold his entire harvest for a great profit. For the first time in six months, the family had plenty to eat. And with the extra money they earned, Wilson's dad was able to buy his son a new pair of boots. The food mom and dad give us now is delicious. Thanks Operation Blessing for helping my family. 
Oh, he's so cute. You just want to pinch his cheeks. Well, we're so glad that he's doing well. And if you'd like to be a part of helping little kids like Wilson, you can. It's so easy. All you have to do is just pick up the phone and say, yes, I want to be a part of changing the world and changing lives like little Wilson there. How much is it? Just 65 cents a day, $20 a month to change the world. And if you join, we have a very special gift for you right now. It's called Our Father Keys to the Lord's Prayer. Gordon put this together. It is tremendous. It breaks down the Lord's Prayer line by line in a way that you've never heard it before. You might have prayed the Lord's Prayer your entire life, but believe me, this will change the way you pray it, and uh, you will be so blessed. So we want you to have this, Our Father, Keys to the Lord's Prayer. 1-800-759-0700 is the number to call, or you can log on to CBN.com. It's another way, great way to give. Right, Pat? Marvelous. Great. <laughs> what a sweet little boy. Yeah, you know. And you, you were saying during the piece that you used to have to we dig had potatoes. The farm where I worked on, they had five acres of potatoes. That was their big money crop, and uh, they sold the potatoes, I think, to Safeway stores. And we had to pick them up by hand. You'd, you'd run a mule down through there and dig them up because <laughs> they're, they're in the ground. And then you have to go out by hand and put the potatoes into buckets, then the buckets into big sacks. I'm trying to picture this. A 13-year-old Pat Robertson <laughs> down on his hands and knees uh, pulling up potatoes. Potatoes and then lifting 100-pound sacks and, and getting, oh, man, it was... Is the trip all day long, though. That was a big money crop, seven and a half acres of potatoes, and, and that, that carried the farm for but the year. But it made you the man that you are. Yes. <laughs> okay. All well, right, we got some good questions well, today. Well, you do, we've got a, we've got a, oh, we got a, a testimony, piece. I think, about a baseball player. It's an all-star, Adrian Gonzalez, who shares how he handles the pressures of performing in the show. I worried that, you know, I don't have a nine to five steady job and what if there aren't always clients and, you know, how do you work that out? Lord just says, um, go ahead, just, you know, try me and see if I don't pour you out a blessing. And I just trusted the Lord. I said, you know, I'm just going to step out in faith. You know, jobs just kept coming in more than I could even handle. So I knew where my blessings were coming from and what they were a result of from giving. Jack and I are having the time of our lives. The kids are on their own, and now we're back in control of our time and the way we spend our money. That's why Consumer Cellular is the perfect cell phone company for us. We get great service, and compared to our old plan, we're saving a ton every month. Consumer Cellular is the wireless provider for people who want affordable service without the contracts. <laughs> Listen, I don't think I'm cheap. I only want to pay for what I need. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what do you pay a month for Consumer Cellular? My bill can be as low as $10, $15 a month. Wow. But we can change our plan anytime. So even those months we use it a lot, we're always getting the best price. Try Consumer Cellular risk-free for 30 days with free activation, a $35 value, and free shipping. Consumer Cellular is the exclusive wireless provider for AARP members. Ask about your special discounts. Call Consumer Cellular at 1-800-730-5103. Go online to ConsumerCellularTV.com or visit a Sears store today. To see this week's top on-demand videos, go to CBN.com. Well, heading into this year, the Los Angeles Dodgers had their eyes on October, and with good reason. Their roster boasts a who's who of MLB stars, anchored by four-time All-Star Adrian Gonzalez. The first baseman is one of the game's best hitters, and recently he told sports reporter Tom Buring what he's holding on to when he steps up to the plate. Adrian Gonzalez stands out among baseball's best hitters. In a game crowded with talent, he was last summer's biggest trade chip, sent from Boston to a Los Angeles team with postseason hopes. Instead, his Dodgers were eliminated from a playoff berth. It's very disappointing. You know, it's 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 tough, especially when you're in the middle of it. You you feel like you got a chance, and uh, all you can do is work as hard as you can. Adrian was the first overall pick of the 2000 Major League Draft. Hard work transformed the first baseman into a four-time All-Star and three-time Gold Glove. Well, hitting's really difficult. I mean, you know, it's about putting in the work, um, being being physically prepared, being mentally prepared, doing everything you can on the video um, end of it, you know, the physical end of it, working in the cage, understanding the, other, the opposing pitcher, all those things, and then just letting, letting the game be the game. 
After playing five of his first seven Major League seasons in his hometown of San Diego, Adrian was traded to the Red Sox, where he then signed a $154 million contract extension. Expectation soared, but the team missed the playoffs. Adrian learned to deal with big market pressure. This, this is a game, we're not robots, we can't come out every day and, and you know, drive that guy in or do everything, you know, there's gonna be a lot of failures and um, it's a long season. Uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of things that, can, good things can happen, bad things can happen. What matters is how we respond to every, every aspect, every situation in the game. And so for me, it's about just letting it happen and just trusting in the Lord. What does Adrian Gonzalez have to be afraid of? Everybody's gonna judge you know, me by, by the statistics at the end of the day, did you get that big hit to, to, to drive in the runs? And so there's gonna be times when you don't produce and everybody's gonna come out and say, hey, what happened? Why didn't you produce? And so th those are all things that we're groomed since we we're little kids to, to come through in those situations. And so, you know, human nature is to, to fear failure. Despite the countless swings over his nine year pro career, Adrian also clinches a reminder Whenever he grabs his bat and the pressure that comes with it, he reads a well-placed inscription that has grabbed his heart. Psalms 27 one had been in my heart for, for a while. I've been, you know, since the time I read it, I just, something that just gave me peace. It says the Lord is my light and my salvation. And whom should I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom should I be afraid? There's times when you're at the plate that it's, it's a tough moment in the game or, you know, it's a tough pitcher or, you know, you're going through tough, rough times at the plate and you're struggling and you, you, all these things are in your head and it turns into an I thought. I want to get ahead. I need to get ahead. And, and when I look at the, at the verse, it's just like, hey, wait, God's in control. It's how I respond to the result that really matters. And so for me, it's about trusting in Jesus and just allowing him to to, to be that, that center of, of, of your thought process. While Adrian's committed to baseball and improving his game, it's not his first priority. You know, if you put, put your purpose on something on earth, you're always putting yourself at risk of, you know, that purpose or that fulfillment not being met. And I can go out there tonight and have a career ending injury. You know, it can, it can be taken away from you in a heartbeat. And so um, you, put, you put your purpose on Jesus. Um, you know, that'll never be taken away. Amen. Great story, Tom. Thanks so much for that. Well, guess what? It's time for Bring It On. Are you ready? No, but let's go for <laughs> it. Yeah, let's go. All right. Patricia says, my best friend is convinced that if I do not attend every church service every week, each week, I guess four times a month, rather, uh, I haven't found uh, I'm not a committed Christian. She says, I haven't found any scripture that says one way or the other, but she says she will no longer stand by me if I go against God's word. We both feel the other is wrong. My heart is so hurt and torn, but I don't want to lose her. Does God really expect me to go to every church service? Does this measure my commitment to him? <laughs> yeah, no, this probably get people upset, but some of the traditional church services are about as much fun as a leg cramp. I mean, you know, <laughs> the, the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the habit of some is. But I, we get so many questions from this legalism. You know, it is the salvation of Jesus. It is faith in Jesus Christ that gets you to heaven, not showing up at church. I mean, they're not these little rules you have to abide by. It is faith in the Lord. And yes, we as Christians are supposed to come together with fellow Christians, but it might be in a Bible study. It might be in a home church. It may be in all kinds of things. You don't have to show up at 11 o'clock in the morning on, on Sunday uh, four times a month in order to get saved. And so th this friend of yours is just off the wall. I, I don't agree with that. All right. Yeah, I wouldn't want a friend like that either. No. Um, Dan writes, I was reading on a message board and someone said that our conception of hell is something that man invented. The Old Testament never talked about hell as a place of eternal fire. When it finally appeared in the New Testament, it seems as if the characteristics of hell were stolen from Greek mythology. Is this you know, true? Any nutcase who wants to can post something on the Internet. I mean, anybody can post, you know. All you got to do is sit at a keyboard and type it out. That's right. All right. Who talked about hell in the New Testament? Jesus. Mm. What did he call it? Gehenna, 
what was Gehenna? It was the city dump outside of Jerusalem. And he said, the fire will not uh, be quenched and the worm won't, won't uh, die. That's the description of hell. But he also described hell as outer darkness, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Who spoke about that? Jesus Christ. He wasn't picking up on some Greek concept. It was out of his own experience. And you talk about hell, you, you, you look at the witch of Endor, she called up Samuel from the depths of the dead mm. uh, to, for Saul. Uh, you look at Job, you know, he says, the worms destroy this body in my flesh, I shall see God. So he was looking forward to a resurrection. It's in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, All right. don't believe what you read on some message board. They are not edited by intelligent people. <laughs> That's All true. right. Diane writes, in the Bible, Proverbs says, love overlooks insults. If someone has insulted me, does this scripture mean that I should choose to endure insults? When is the right time to confront someone if they've insulted you? You know, uh, I was reading uh, yesterday uh, what's called the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus said, if somebody hits you on one side of your face, mm. turn the other cheek. Turn the other cheek. Mm. Turn the other. Let him hit you again. Mm. Uh, if somebody wants to steal away your coat, give him your, your undergarment as well. Somebody forces you to go a mile, go two. The Bible is one that says, let's live in peace with each other and let's endure things. And, and Jesus Christ himself endured suffering and torment. And he didn't curse and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. That's the attitude we're supposed to have as Christians, to love our enemies, do good to them, and respectfully use us and persecute us. That's what it says. And uh, sometime along the way, you might want to set the record state, but all that stuff comes in. I want to justify myself so I will be proved right. Yeah. And what we, the Bible says is let God justify you and watch what happens. Okay. He's much better at it. Much better. All right. I am 15 years old and a Christian. Uh, this is Mariah. I am having trouble believing in prayer. How can I get through this? Does prayer work? Uh, <laughs> what's his name? Mar it's Mariah. This uh, is a, she. A 15 year old girl. Mariah, uh, you're 15. You know, they usually say, I'm 16 and never been kissed. I don't know if you've been kissed at 15, but let me ask you, does kissing work? <laughs> you know, but I mean, what do you say? A prayer doesn't work. Prayer is a relationship with somebody who loves you very much. Mm. And, uh, uh, you know, you, I, I was reading the other day about Elijah, uh, who, you know, he prayed and he got on his knees and he prayed. Then he prayed again and he prayed again. He prayed again. And finally, it was a little teeny cloud. And he says, OK, a rainstorm's coming. But he kept praying. He was a person who had the same passions we do, but he didn't stop praying. Jesus says, keep on asking and you'll receive. Keep on knocking, the door will be open. Keep on, keep on, keep on seeking and you will find. You know, that's what he said. Don't stop. Great analogy, kid, between kissing and prayer. I'm never going to forget that. <laughs> I thought I, for a little girl, I thought I'd pray, put Perfect. that in your mind. Or a big girl. Well, that's a, a big girl, too. Well, that's all the time we have for today's program. Tomorrow, a mother comes face to face with a man who killed her son. Watch what happens when we, they meet. And on Tuesday, we leave you with these words from Psalm, for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Hi, I'm Terry Mewson. I'd like to tell you about Orphan's Promise. Orphan's Promise helps children who've had tragic beginnings in life. My father died, my mother started drinking, and gave me away to the orphanage. We were homeless, and she made me beg for food. We don't know where our sister is. I'm looking for her now. We want to return to be with our mother, but she doesn't want us. In many countries, children are turned out of orphanages when they turn 16. They lose the only security they've ever known. Many will become easy prey for prostitution rings and criminal gangs. Together, you and I can break this cycle for these kids. For just $20 a month, you'll provide computer training, life skills, and people that care, preparing them for a future of hope. Show them God's love. Call the number on your screen right now and say you'll help.